Hey friends, it is Jenna What Is Up and welcome back to the Board Game Garden and welcome to a Kickstarter preview of this game right here. This is Critter Kitchen, which um, this is definitely one of my most anticipated games of the year. So I cannot tell you guys how happy I am to be covering this on my channel right now. Huge shout out to Cardboard Alchemy for sponsoring today's video and working with me. I really appreciate it. Critter Kitchen is going to be coming to Kickstarter on October 24th. This video is going to be going up a few days before that. So definitely go and check it out. Go and follow the campaign if you are interested in it. I will have the link down below to the campaign so you guys can go and check it out. Um, um, but yes, Critter Kitchen is published, like I mentioned, by Cardboard Alchemy, and it is designed by Alex Cutler as well as Peter C. Hayward, and the art is by Sandara Tang. You might recognize the style of art um, from Sandara. She also helped with the art or did the art for Flamecraft as well, which Flamecraft is one of Cardboard Alchemy's other titles and one very successful title, so I'm sure that a lot of people are very, very excited about this next one, which is Critter Kitchen. So yes, we are going to get into this video. My previews are usually structured where um, the first section I'm going to kind of give you an aim of the game, a little bit of how it is going to play. I will show you all of the different components and then we'll get into a how to play. It's not going to be a super in-depth how to play. Um, I will say that this is definitely more of a heavier game than um, Flamecraft, I'm sure, I'm gonna say it right now in the intro here, I'm sure a lot of people are wondering what this is like compared to Flamecraft, and I will say that this one is definitely um, a little bit heavier in weight, so in complexity. There's definitely more going on in this game. It's a little bit more crunchy and has some more difficult decisions when it comes to um, where you're going, what you are taking, um, what you are keeping, all those things throughout the game. So Critter Kitchen is definitely one step up from Flamecraft, but I wouldn't say that you really can compare the two too, too much because they are completely different games, like completely, completely different games. They just have a similar um, vibe to them, a similar look obviously because they are from the same artist and from the same like developers and stuff with the cardboard alchemy team so yes without further ado if you guys want to see more about um, Critter Kitchen, then just keep on watching and give this video a big thumbs up if you enjoy. Also hit the subscribe button down below if you've yet to do so. We'd love to have you here in the garden. And comment down below if Critter Kitchen is one that you are going to be picking up. Like I mentioned, I will have the link to the Kickstarter down below if you guys want to go and check it out and get some more information on it and all those things. But yes, without further ado, let's get into this preview of Critter Kitchen, shall we? All right, so for the aim of the game of Critter Kitchen, basically each player is going to be playing as a restaurateur or an owner of their own restaurant, and they are going to have three different chefs that they are going to be able to um, put out into town, and each of the different chefs are going to have a different speed, as well as a different amount of items that they can collect from the location that they choose to go to. So um, you're going to be making these decisions simultaneously and secretly where each player is going to have cards, they're going to place them down, everyone will flip those over at the same time, and then that will determine where each of their three chefs are going to go, and then wherever they are, they will pick up items, bring it back to the restaurant to cook dishes. So this game is um, played over seven different rounds. I take it as it's a full week, so each round is a day. And after day three, as well as after day six, all the players will go into a serve challenge where you will have some dishes that you're wanting to cook. You're going to be placing these items onto these little plates and then getting a certain amount of victory points for the um, quality of that dish. So each of the food items are going to have a number on them and the higher the number, the better quality of the item that you're putting into your dish, the better that dish is going to be and therefore the more victory points you are going to get for that dish. So basically by the end of the game, all the players are going to be counting up all of their victory points and whatever player has the most victory points at the end of the game is going to be the best restaurateur in town. Um, but also at the end of the seven rounds, so once you are finished with that serve challenge on round six or at the end of round six, you'll go into round seven. That'll be your last chance to grab a few more items because there is going to be a critic chef. So there are a bunch of
bunch of different types of chefs that you can choose from. You'll go through and choose one of the critic chefs to play for. For that game, the one that I currently have now is the Tree Shrew. Thought that would be fitting for the board game garden. And each of the critic chefs do have some sort of um, way that they will be scoring for their plate at the end of the game. So the tree shrew here says throughout the game spice multiplies the ingredient value by three instead of two, which I will explain spice in a second. But yes, once you are finished with the um, critic, which I will add, you have the critic plate right here, where you are going to serve one of each ingredient of your best quality to the critic in order to gain victory points at the end of the game. So there is this great push and pull of do I use ingredients for these um, serve challenges or do I keep some of them for the end game because you are going to be gaining a lot of victory points for both of them. So it's this really nice balance of trying to get some victory points from those serve challenges but then also keeping some of the ingredients in order to serve that um, critic chef. So that is pretty much everything for the aim of the game. You'll be going through, you'll be going to town, collecting different ingredients, and then cooking for the serve challenges at the end of round three and six. You'll have one last round to gather a few more ingredients for the critic chef, and then at the end of that seventh round, you'll be serving the critic chef that wonderful plate of food, and then you will score your victory points, and then whatever player has the most victory points will win the game. So. Yes, that is that for the aim of the game. We are now going to quickly just go over an overview of all of the different components. So starting off with the center of the table here, this is the main board, which you have the center board here that kind of gives you a layout of where to put everything. So you have all of the cards at the top. You have the six different um, serve challenge uh, dishes that you're going to be cooking. Um, each of them, one is going to be flipped at the beginning of every round, so you can kind of see the dishes that you are working towards. Um, you also have the round tracker here, so you're going one, two, three. You have a serve challenge, four, five, six. Another serve challenge, seven, and then you have the critic and the end game scoring there. So it kind of gives you a little bit of a schedule or timeline of what you're going to be doing in the game. You also up here have a space for the critic chef that you chose for this game. You have three different rumors, which we'll get into how you look at these rumors. These are going to be secret from the players, and then you're going to be obtaining different tiles that will allow you to look at these um, rumors secretly and help you with um, different things. So that is that. You also have below all of the different shops in town. There are several different shops that you're going to be playing with, but there's going to be certain ones that you do and don't play with determined by the player count. But with all player counts, you are going to be playing with the soup truck as well as it says here the black market, but they have since changed it to the Midnight Merchant, which I do love the name of that, as well as you're always going to be playing with the Chef Academy, which there is another side of the board for a two player game, but every other one, they are numbered one through five and Depending on the player count, that's how many of those tiles you will play with. So this is a setup for three players. So I have the Garden Top Shop, the Desert Vendor, as well as the Water Market. But additionally, you do have these two here for a four and five player game. So you have the Air Docks as well as the All Items Alley, which I believe this is now called Lanterns Lane or Lanterns Alley. Um, they are still, I will mention, this is a prototype. It is a very nice prototype, but it still is a prototype and they still are making some changes. So, yes. Also, I'm sure a lot of you are probably wondering, is there a solo mode for Critter Kitchen? And as of right now, there is not, sadly. But very much like Flamecraft, which initially Flamecraft did not have a solo either, but what they are doing is they are going to be um, making a solo mode and then that is going to be, um, or they are working on a solo mode right now for Critter Kitchen, but it is going to be a stretch goal. So the campaign is going to have to get to a certain level in order for the solo mode to be um, included. So yes, if you want a solo mode, 
definitely go and check the um, stretch goals and see where it needs to be in order to get that solo mode. And hopefully uh, the solo board gaming community will get it there because I am really, really hoping that they end up making a solo mode for Critter Kitchen. They have expressed that they really do want to. Um, so yes, anyways, back to components. Um, we have, like I said, the main board. You also over here have some zoo chefs, which is the cutest thing, um, but zoo chefs or sous chefs, um, they are going to be one round um, workers, just temporary workers that you can use additionally um, to your three that you always have for one round only, and then you will have to put them back. You have to go to the Chef Academy in order to get one of those zoo chefs. There's going to be a different zoo chef every single round, and then whoever goes there and grabs that zoo chef will be able to use it in the next round, and then they'll have to discard it after that. Additionally, on this side of the board, we have the victory points here, which are little star tokens. There are fives and tens there as well. And like I said, you will be gaining victory points throughout the game with the serve challenges as well as at the end of the game with the critic um, chef. You also have soup, which soup can be used to add quality to your dishes, um, add numbers um, in order to gain more victory points. You also have bisque, which is a power of three, so it can add three to your dishes. Um, and those can be used on top of any of the other items. And the soup and bisque tiles will obviously be obtained by going to the soup truck, as well as if you ever go to a location and you end up not being able to get any of the items, you kind of just get a soup as like a consolation prize for coming to that location, but not getting anything. So you'd be able to grab a soup. Uh, if that was the case. And lastly, for the main area, you have the priority board right here. So this is going to be the priority order for when there are more than one of the same type of worker on a spot, um, you will look to the priority board for who gets to choose first. Um, and in some cases, you will end up going to the back for doing that. In other cases, you will not. Um, but the priority will always be changing. Um, on the priority board. All right, so that is everything for the main board. Let's get into all of the components that you have for each of the players. This is two to five players. There are five different player colors. I have purple and red right in front of you, which you obviously cannot see. There is yellow as well as orange, and then I have blue right here. So each player is going to have their main player board right here, a spot for their little mouse chef, their lizard chef, as well as their boar chef. And then they're going to have a spot for three different cards. And then each player is going to have cards that represent each of the locations. Obviously with the player count, you will take out some certain cards that are not in play. And then you will, like I said, simultaneously be choosing cards, placing them in each spot for each of your chefs, and then simultaneously revealing them and then going to those spaces. So you have those different cards to do that. Each player also does have a little, um, like, what is this called? Like screen? So you can actually keep your chef critic plate private here, as well as your other three plates. And then all of the different items that you're going to be obtaining or uh, food items are going to be placed behind the uh, screen as well. And the nice thing is that the screen actually doubles as a little bit of a player aid, which I really, really love how they did that. That is everything that each player has. And I believe that is everything for the different components. There are some additional modules and stuff, which we'll get to in another section, but that is generally all of the components for playing the base game of Critter Kitchen. I will mention the other stuff a little bit later, but for now, let's get into a little bit more of how the game plays. All right, so like I mentioned in the aim of the game section of the video, Critter Kitchen is played over seven rounds and each of those seven rounds are going to be played out the exact same. So starting off, each player is, like I said, going to have their hand of cards with some taken out depending on player count and what um, different vendors are going to be available. And each player simultaneously and secretly are going to choose where they want their mouse chef, their lizard chef, as well as their boar chef to go. Now each chef are going to be doing things a little bit different. Um, the mouse chef is going to be the fastest chef, but they are only going to be able to pick up one item. 
The lizard is going to be the second fastest, is going to be able to pick up two items. And the boar chef is the slowest, but they do pick up three items. So you are going to be determining depending on the different items that are going to be out, which actually right now there are no items out. So actually the first thing that's going to happen is a player is going to be taking items out of the bag and they're going to be placing items on to each of these shops. Each shop for the most part is going to have three different spaces for items. The soup truck as well as the Midnight Merchant and Chef Academy are a little bit different, but you're going to put out those food items and each player is going to be looking at those items and determining what chef they want to send to that specific spot. So for example, I might see that there is a level seven, which I will mention that each of the items go from a level two to a level seven. So seven is the best that you can possibly get. So I might see that there is a level seven fish at the desert vendor. So I might say I'm going to place my desert vendor card there for my mouse. I might say, hey, I wanna go to the midnight merchant with my lizard, which we'll get into in a second. And then maybe I want to go to the Chef Academy with my boar. So I'll place those there. The rest I will just place face down. And then once every player has decided on the three places that they want to go with their chefs, every player is going to flip those over. And then you are going to proceed to place your little meeples onto those three spaces. So my little mouse is gonna go to the desert vendor. My lizard is going to go to the midnight merchant. And then my boar is gonna go to the chef academy. And once all of that is finished, each player will then have all of their different meeples at all of the different shops that they chose. And you will go from left to right, playing out each of the shops and each player getting what they would like. So the first one here is the soup truck, which no players are currently at the soup truck, but basically when there are leftovers, which leftovers typically go to the chef academy, but if no one takes them from the chef academy, they then get placed into the soup truck for the next day. And any of those are going to be placed here. There's also always going to be one of the three level bisque available at the soup truck. So when you are choosing to go to the soup truck, you are either wanting to grab some soup for some different dishes, or you see that there's some good leftovers from the Chef Academy last round that you want to grab. You'll then move into the next shops. There could be three, four, or five of these, depending on player count. In a three player game, obviously there are three. And I will actually go over the like order of how things are taken with these three shops. So basically, if there is going to be a mouse there, that means that this player gets to take something first but they only can take one thing. So with this little red mouse here, I could decide that I wanna take this six meat. Place that behind my screen and then that would be the turn for that red mouse. Moving on to the desert vendor, there is a mouse here, which that means this mouse gets to pick first. They get to pick one thing. So I, that was my blue mouse, I'm gonna take that seven level fish. I'll place that behind my screen as well. And the next two are actually both lizards. So in this situation where there are two of the same chefs, basically you will look at the priority track and whatever player is higher up on the priority track, that is the player that will take first. So in this situation, purple is higher. So that means that purple would take next. Maybe they want to take this for carrot. And then the red lizard would take the remaining and then that would be everything. Unfortunately, because there's only three there and one of the um, items were already taken by the mouse, obviously the lizards only get one each as well, but if there was more items there, they would then go again, the purple would take one again, and then the red would take one again. But obviously there are no more items there, so the players would take their lizards off and you'd move on to the next building. I will mention right now, if this boar was here, at the desert vendor. He would actually not get anything, which is very sad because the lizards would obviously take the items, the mouse would take the first one, the lizards would take the other two, and unfortunately this boar would not get anything. But he does get a little bit of a consolation prize for being there, so the boar would then be able to get one of the soups, and that player would take their meeple back and put it on their player board. I will mention quickly before we move on to the water market, 
when there is a tie, if the tie is the first thing that is being resolved um, at a building, this would actually make for the priority track to change. So in this situation, if that mouse wasn't there before the two lizards, if the two lizards were the first thing that were playing out for this location, the purple would take first, but that would mean that the purple would actually move behind the red. But that is only if the tie is the first thing that is being resolved uh, with that location. So moving on to the water market, because the boar is the only chef at this location, they actually get to take all of the items here. Because the boar is able to take three items, they would then be able to just take all three of these and put them back behind their screen, which I feel like would be a very good turn and I would have felt very good about that turn, honestly. Um, but moving on to the Midnight Merchant. So this one is a little bit of a gamble because players will be going to the Midnight Merchant hoping for things that they want to come out because there are no items here when you are selecting the places that you want to go. And the items actually get taken out and placed when you are um, resolving the Midnight Merchant. So. Once you got to this location, you would take five items out of the bag and those would be the items the players would be able to choose from. So like I said, it's a little bit of a gamble, a little bit of chance there for you hoping that maybe you will get something that you want. So in this uh, situation here, the lizard would go first. They would be able to take their two items. So in this situation, this blue player, or actually that would be me, I would maybe take the level seven mushroom and level six cheese, place those behind my board. I would take back my meeple and then the boar would then go and then they would be able to take the remaining three here, which this actually leads me to another great thing, which is a rumor token. So if you ever get or take a rumor token from a location, this actually allows you to hear a rumor about the critic chef. So there are three different rumors going around about the critic chef and different things that they kind of like more than other things and different things that they would like to see. So we have this rumor token here. The purple player would then be able to peek at this specific rumor card here. This one that I have is called Varied Servings. So one star for each unique number plated, plus one additional star for whoever plates the most unique numbers. So you are wanting to, with your uh, critic's plate here, have different um, levels of the ingredients. And then whoever had the most different numbers would be able to gain one additional victory point for that. So that would be a really cool thing to know so that when you're aiming for the critic plate at the end of the game, you'll be able to gain more victory points for that hidden information that you found out. So now that we're done with the Midnight Merchant, we're gonna move on to the Chef Academy. This is another one that is always in the game, no matter the player count. And the Chef Academy is going to be where all leftovers are going to be put, which this spot right here actually had some leftovers. So whenever there's a location where items don't get picked up, you're going to take those leftovers, you're gonna place them in the Chef Academy, and then players that placed their chefs on the Chef Academy will have the option to grab those. But there's one additional thing for the Chef Academy, and that is the Zoo Chefs. So like I mentioned, the Zoo Chef is like a temporary worker that you're gonna have for that next round, and then that is it. And each Zoo Chef is going to give you different abilities and different um, things to be able to do on the next round. Um, so this mouse chef right here might say, hey, I want to grab the zoo chef. So they might grab the zoo chef. They will then grab the coordinating card. This one here is Cecilia. She is a python and very much like the boar, she has a speed of three as well as a capacity of three. So she is going to be taking a little bit later, but she is going to be able to get um, three items or pick up three items. And she also has a special ability that says, after your turn for each meat that Cecilia takes, also gain an item from the draw bag. Ooh, that's fun. So that is Cecilia. If that player decided to take that, they would take the little player marker here as well as Cecilia's card and they would place that beside their board. The only other player here at the Chef Academy is the blue boar, which is my blue boar. And sadly, there are only two items here, but they are pretty good items. There's a sixth strength fish as well as a sixth strength 
uh, carrot, so I would be able to take both of those. Sadly, I wasn't able to take three items because there wasn't any there. And I think I mentioned a little bit earlier on that when a chef is at a location and they don't gain any items, they do gain a soup. In the situation where this boar got two of the three, he would not get a soup to make up the three. Um, he would just gain those two and then leave the location. And that is everything for a full round. If there were any items still in the Chef Academy, they would then be taken over to the soup truck for the next round. A new zoo chef would be flipped over and placed into the Chef Academy. A new uh, food item or serve challenge item would be flipped over as well. But that actually brings us in to when a serve challenge um, happens. So this is going to be at the end of round three. So in this instance, if the round that I just played out was round three, you would go into the serve challenge um, right now. So each player does have three little plates, which I think is the cutest thing ever. And each player is going to have the opportunity to serve any of these three that they would like. They do not have to serve any. They could serve one, they could serve two, they could serve all three. You can't serve multiple of one of the dishes, but you have three different ones here to choose from. The last one here has one of the ingredients um, kind of covered up. So the only two that you can put for this savory stack is the cheese and the meat and the mushroom is covered up. Um, but for the other ones, you have three different ingredients and players can decide if they want to plate any of these items, which in this situation, I don't think I have anything that I can plate. For example, I am gonna you know, get something out of here so that I can serve something. Oh, that is going to be a very strong dish. Okay, so for example, if I had these items here and I wanted to maybe plate something here, I would be able to Hmm, let me say, I'm gonna plate the savory stacks. So that means I would have to take any amount of cheese as well as meat. You can put on as many of those items as you want. You can also additionally put on soup. So if I had some soup, if I ever like went to the soup truck or if I was unable to get something at one of the locations, I would have soup. And the amount of victory points that I'm going to get for these dishes is going to be determined by this little chart here and how much that dish adds up to. So for example here, I currently have a seven and a six, so that is 13, um, which if you have six plus, you get one victory point. Uh, 12 plus you get two victory points and then 21 plus you get four victory points So I might want to say I'm gonna you know save my my soup and I'm just gonna serve this 13 strength uh, Savory stack if I had any other ingredients for the other items I could plate those up as well and get victory points determined by the amount that it adds up to but for this instance I will just do that I would gain one victory point for that serve challenge all players would do this simultaneously, putting on all the ingredients onto the plates, serving those plates, getting the victory points based off of how much it adds up to, and then all of those that they use would then get discarded and you would move on to the next round. I will also quickly mention that soup as well as bisque can be in place of another ingredient. So if I decided to do this and I didn't have bread, I could put soup on the plate um, to kind of distract from the fact that I didn't have bread, um, but you cannot have an entire plate of soup. So you couldn't say like, hey, I'm gonna put all this soup and this bisque on this plate and serve it as the ultimate melt. You can't do that. You can only replace the soup with one or two of the ingredients. And then lastly, for the serve challenge, both for the one after the third round as well as the one after the sixth round, there is going to be a maximum of how many items you can move forward with. So after the first serve challenge, you can only move forward with a max of five things in your refrigerator. So in this instance here, I have four ingredients left over. So I would not be to the max of five, so I wouldn't have to discard anything. I do have two soups, but soups do not need to be refrigerated, so I would be good in that instance. And then for the serve challenge that is after round six, that one allows you to have a max of 10 instead of five. All right, so that is everything. The last thing that I'm going to talk about is the seventh round and what happens after the seventh round. So in the seventh round, this is going to be where you can kind of last minute get some of the items that you want for your Critic Chef's plate. There's also a allspice token that is going to be placed on the spot that typically a zoo chef would be placed on. 
Obviously in the last round, you're not gonna be wanting a Zoo Chef for the next round because there's not a next round. So an All Spice will be placed on the Chef Academy, but that is a good time for me to explain quickly what spices are. So there are going to be items that are spice of that particular item. So there's going to be a fish spice, there's going to be a mushroom spice. Whenever you gain those tiles, you can use them as a spice for that item and that item will then, uh, the power of that item will then be doubled. But you guys might have remembered with the tree shoe, this is that the spice multiplies the ingredient by three instead of two. So this is actually um, going to change up the game quite a bit where when you are playing with the tree shoe, you are definitely gonna want to try to get those spice tiles. But for the allspice, this one can be placed on an item of your choice. It can be placed on any of the seven different ingredient types in order to multiply it by two or three if you're playing with the tree shoe. Um, so that you could get instead of the zoo chef for the seventh round. But once that seventh round is over, you will then move in to the last part of the game, which is the critic chef round. So this will be where every player simultaneously behind their screen will work out their critic chef plate so they will put one of each of the seven ingredients um, so they are going to try to be holding their best of that certain ingredient to the end um, for this instance i do have a six carrot a seven fish and a seven mushroom i obviously would want to get some additional ones um, i didn't play a full game so i don't have all of them but generally you do want to get one of each of the ingredients you will be getting victory points for having one of every single one. You don't have to, but you do want to. Also, you can decide to use spice in this round. Um, soup cannot be used on the critic's plate, so you will not be able to use those, but you will score some victory points for those at the end as well. You will then, with all other players, go through and see who has the highest of each of the ingredients. So who has the best bread, who has the best carrot, who has the best cheese, so on and so forth. You will also reveal all of the different rumors and score for those. Um, some of them are going to be this type where it's like tells you something that you're going to gain additional victory points for. But some of them are also that some of the ingredients might be doubled. Um, this one right here is Fish Fanatic. Double the value of your plated fish course. So with this, whatever your fish course was, you would double that. In this instance, mine would be 14 instead of seven. Um, this one here is varied leftovers. So one star for each unique number on an ingredient not placed. So whatever ingredients you had not placed on the plate, you would gain additional victory points for those, as well as the one that we went over before, which is one star for each unique number plated, plus one star for whoever plates the most unique numbers which in this instance, I have two sevens and one six, so I would not be getting too many victory points for that. And then for scoring for the actual chef critics plate here, you will actually flip over your player board and there's actually a way for you to score your plate here. You would actually take your little mouse meeple and move it to wherever your plate added up to. So you would add up all of the individual numbers on all of your ingredients, plus any of like the doubling from any of the rumors as well as your spice and stuff like that. And then you would have your finishing total. So for example, if I got to 54, let's say, I would then look over and see that I got eight um, victory points for that. So I would take eight of the stars and then you would just add up all of your stars from whatever you got throughout the game with the challenges. And then whoever had the most victory points would be the winner. All right, friends. So that is everything for a little overview of how the game plays. I probably missed a few small little rules here and there, but that is a gist of how it plays. And hopefully that will allow you to determine if this is something that you would enjoy joy but I also do want to mention there are a few different modules like I said the first one here is the restaurant tours module which is just giving each player an individual player power um, there are five different restaurant tours here and they are kind of funny takes on actual celebrity chefs so we have Julia Wilde here we have uh, Martha Shreert Sh Sh Shrewart Shrewart Martha Shrewart I think a shrew wart is something, a type of animal. Uh, we have Jamie Oliver. I love that one so much. We have Bobcat Filet, as well as Anthony Bourdain. 
so, so funny. I think these are some of my favorite puns I have ever heard in my life. So those are some different restaurateurs that you can add at the beginning of the game. Um, and each player is going to have a certain little uh, player ability. Anthony Bourdain here is your lizard and boar chefs may carry plus one ingredients. So that is kind of nice. And then also, I'm not going to get into each of these individually, but there are five different small little modules that you can add to the game that, you know, change things up a little bit. There is the tofu module. There is the sauce module. There is the ice module, the trophy module, as well as the organic module. So like I said, I'm not going to get too much into those, but they do give you a little card here that tells you how to implement that certain module into the game. And each of them does have a little board here with some different tiles um, that you incorporate into the game. So yes, that is going to be everything for this preview of Critter Kitchen. Hopefully you guys enjoyed. If you did, please give this video a big thumbs up. Also hit that subscribe button down below if you've yet to do so. We'd love to have you here in the garden. Comment down below now that you've watched this video if Critter Kitchen is is something that you are interested in. Um, definitely love to chat about that down below. I will have the, like I said in the description box, the link to the Kickstarter so you guys can go and check that out. Um, go and support Cardboard Alchemy. Um, and yeah, I love you guys so, so much. Huge thank you to Cardboard Alchemy again for sponsoring today's video. Remember, you are somebody's reason to smile and I will see you guys in the next board game video. Bye friends.